Hello, everybody. We'll get started. It's 2 o'clock. I'm Judy Matson, and on behalf of the Bonner Milltown History Center and Museum, welcome to our second roundtable. So, um, if we could have everybody's attention so we could get going here. Today is a celebration of sorts. It's our 39th roundtable. And a quick check of past roundtables shows that since these programs started in 2009, we have had 105 speakers, and I think that's an undercount, and they have graciously donated their time to keep our history alive. And please notice that I used the word donated. We want to recognize this dedication to historic preservation. No speaker has ever asked for payment for providing time and expertise. And we have never charged admission to any of our programs. They are free and open to all. We also would like to recognize the um, generosity of all of the donors, many in this room, who are the heart and soul of Bonner Milltown History Center. And we thank you so much for your loyalty. And finally, I'd like to invite our new followers to join in the Bonner spirit of community and make a donation if you haven't already. If you would like to donate today, you can fill out a donation slip and leave it um, with the greeter. And we will uh, deposit it and send you a, a tax, uh, tax receipt because your donation is tax deductible. If you want to take it home and send a check later, um, grab one of these and take it with you and mail it in. And same thing, you'll get a tax receipt. So um, we love what we do, and we run a frugal ship, but costs are going up. And so we are hoping that we can expand our donor base. Um, rumor has it that we're planning a, a historical fundraising event in the fall. So keep your eyes peeled for more information. I got a few quick notes. Uh, most importantly, the bathrooms location. Men's are on the right down here, and women's are down the hall past the gift shop. We want to thank, as always, MCAT for providing this important gift to preserve our timber heritage history. Ron is back with us again today thanks to the media assistance grant that MCAT donates. Missoula Community Access Television serves the Missoula area on cable channels 189 and 190. Today's completed program will premiere on the MCAT channel 189 a month from now, and it's going to be downloaded to a video on demand. If you have any questions about how to uh, get a production grant for one of your projects, please contact MCAT at MCAT.org or call them at 542-6228. All of the previous roundtables dating back to 2009 were recorded, edited, and produced by Missoula Community Access Television, and all of them are available also on our website at BonnerMilltownHistory.org. Of course, we need to thank the Kettle House. Their support and interest in our history have been phenomenal. We hope that you will return that sport today and in the future. They offer, which you may already know, beer, hard seltzers, and house-made root beer or water. They also offer bar snacks such as Chex Mix, pretzels, bag chips, and popcorn, and beef sticks from Cop Beef. The Savadi food truck is available right outside for an after-program dinner. Thanks also to Friends of Two Rivers who sponsor the Bonner Milltown History Center. Thanks to Walter, our sound technician. And finally, thanks to Steve Nelson, Mike Baim, and Mike Heisey for providing a home for the History Center. We're in the Bonner Post Office building and open to the public on Wednesdays, 10 to noon. On Tuesdays, 9 to noon, the coffee group meets for lively conversation and cookies. And on Fridays, the Old Roads and Rabbit Holes group meets at 10 a.m. And I'm not going to put an ending time because you just never know when they get down a rabbit hole. But please stop by and join in the fun. Today, we're going to have a traveling mic for questions and stories. And we're changing the format a little bit uh, because we're going to have questions throughout the presentation. So wait for the mic 
so if you have a question or a comment so that everybody can hear your question, including Tony, and say your name, that's important. We're gonna take a brief intermission partway through Tony's talk for a beer and or bathroom break. Okay, that does it for announcements. I'm gonna introduce now Miney Smith, who's right here. Miney is the co-director of the Bonner Milltown History Center and a founding member who came to love Bonner history through her research and scholarship dating back to the super fun cleanup days. She's the author of The Missoula Mercantile, The Store That Ran an Empire. It is a great read, and if you haven't read it and would like to read it, copies are available on, at the door, the front door. They're only $10, and she's donating all the proceeds to the History Center. So thank you, Wani. And that's the end of my spiel. Wani, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Well, and welcome um, to the uh, round, round table today. Um, it's going to be given, presented by Tony Leanne, and he's quite knowledgeable on this subject because he, I tell you, he um, graduated from the University of M Montana, is that better? Sorry. <laughs> uh, forestry School and then began his career working for the Anaconda Company in 1971. Following a uh, military service, he returned to Bonner as a forester for Champion uh, International until Champion sold to Plum Creek in 1993. He then became the uh, area manager of Montana's uh, Department of Natural Resources Southwestern Land Office until retiring in, in 2014. And so he, he sort of organized all the um, cleanup of the black, the removal of the dam and took pictures of it. And so he's a good person to present it. Um, anyway, now I introduce um, Tony. Okay, can, can you hear me? We're, we're good, Walter? Okay. Uh, Kim says it should go a little higher on the volume. Can you hear back there, Kim? Okay, take the earplugs out, maybe that'll help, so. <laughs> okay, well, I wanna uh, thank uh, Judy and Miney for uh, getting the program started here, uh, introducing me. Uh, Miney kind of gave me a little more credit for what happened on the river than I really deserved. Uh, there was a, a, a great number of organizations uh, that were local government, county government, state government, federal government, uh, Native American tribes, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that were all involved in not only the project here on the Blackfoot, but also the project on the uh, uh, Milltown Dam and the cleanup of the reservoir. Uh, so there's a, a lot of credit to go around to a lot of organizations. And without any of these organizations uh, working together uh, the cleanup that happened both on the Clark Fork and the Blackfoot may not have happened uh, as, uh, as readily as it did. And so we really want to uh, show our appreciation to all of those organizations that, that push for uh, the cleanup of not only the Clark Fork but also the Blackfoot River uh, because it was, it was critically important. Uh, looking at the crowd today, my guess is that there's probably very few people here who don't know about the Milltown Dam and the cleanup behind the Milltown Dam. Uh, and if there is anybody here who doesn't know about it, you're not gonna learn much today from me because the program is basically uh, about what happened on the Blackfoot River. And there may be people here who don't know about the Bonner Dam, and uh, because it was kind of hidden away between the mountain and the mill, 
And the mill workers, you know, obviously were aware of that, that Bonner Dam, uh, but a lot of the local public didn't know about it. And so hopefully this program today will uh, allow people to get a better understanding of not only the, the history behind the Bonner Dam, but also uh, the, the work that was done to clean up not only taking the dam out, but cleaning up the river uh, after the dam came out. So hopefully you'll find it, it interesting and, and, uh, and informative. Uh, so um, before we get into the slide presentation, I think we need to go back into history a little further, quite a bit further. Uh, back to the Native Americans of the Rocky Mountains, of Montana and Idaho, and the importance that these rivers had to those tribes, um, both for fishing and for routes of, of travel, going to various uh, uh, parts of uh, western Montana for hunting, fishing, and just moving uh, seasonally there uh, their, their camps. Uh, so these rivers were very, very important. Uh, for thousands of years, uh, the Native Americans uh, took a trail that we think pretty sure goes over that rock bluff right there and then came right down that draw across the river. And so that was the, that was the trail that the Native Americans took to go over the Continental Divide uh, to hunt buffalo. And so that was, you know, how many hundreds or thousands of years that trail was used, I have no idea, but it was a long time. Then in 1806, there was what we believe to be the first group of white men. And it was a group led by Meriwether Lewis that used that trail, came down that draw, on their way east towards St. Louis at the end of their epic journey across to Montana and the Northwest. Uh, so there's a lot of history that's happened on this river. And it's, it's you know, you, you get into it, and it's really some interesting stuff that you can, you can find in, in, if you get into the history books. Um, so, 1806, a group of white men with Meriwether Lewis in the lead came up the river following the trail to the buffalo. The Native Americans had, probably each tribe had a name for that trail, and it wasn't the only trail. There were many trails that crossed the mountains uh, to the, the east of the Continental Divide to hunt buffalo. But this was an important one for the Salish, probably the Kootenai, the Nez Perce, uh, that, that followed that trail. Uh, I can't pronounce the names that they gave it, but the white men gave it the name of the Trail to the Buffalo. And so the Trail to the Buffalo was right over there. 1806, Lewis, or Meriwether Lewis, uh, his party went up there. Seventy-some years later, another group of white men decided that the place we're sitting on would make a great location for a mill. And uh, so they had a company, it was called the Montana Improvement Company, and in order to uh, develop a mill site and supply it with logs, uh, one of the first things they had to do was to build a dam. In 1884, just 78 years after Lewis and his party went on the trail to the Buffalo, they started building a dam on the Blackfoot River. So this is the earliest picture that I've been able to find. Can everybody see this? Um, this picture was taken in 1891 and it shows the Bonner Dam, uh, shows the powerhouse over here, uh, the dam structure itself, 
Um, and so it was built in 1884. Well, Mother Nature didn't like the idea of a bunch of guys coming out here and damming up the Blackfoot River. So the spring of 1885, high water came out and washed out a lot of the dam. So 1885, they rebuilt the dam and it was completed in time for the opening of the uh, Big Blackfoot Lumber Mill in 1886. So that's the beginning of the history of the mill site and the Bonner Dam. This is a picture of the uh, river, the dam, the mill site in 1907. And I want you to notice the width of the river here. And it's, it's fairly wide. Um, the mill site set up here, the dam across the, uh, the Blackfoot, and these structures out in the river all the way up, even up to the way station, across from the way station, uh, these cribs were built. And those cribs had chains like this right here, strung between them, anchored into the rock wall across the river, probably anchored on this side. And those cribs and those log chains would hold the logs back from floating down the river. So keep in mind, in your, in your mind, what the river looked like in 1907. 1908, this is probably the spring of 1908, Mother Nature again tried to take out the Bonner Dam. But all the logs that come down, there's pictures of a log jab that goes way, way up the river and comes down. And uh, it's, it's pretty well, the river's pretty well filled with logs, but it looks like primarily these cribs are doing the job of holding the logs back. Um, what I've read is because of that high water in 1908, uh, they breached the Bonner Dam with uh, dynamite in order to protect the, most of the structure. Uh, at the same time, the Milltown Dam was in place, and the Milltown Dam, from what I've read, and there's various questions, was also breached by dynamite in order to protect the powerhouse on the Milltown Dam. Now, the, the history behind the Milltown Dam, the Bonner Dam, Bonner Dam was built in 1884. Milltown Dam wasn't built until probably 1907, rebuilt in 1908 after the flood of 1908. Um, the Bonner Dam, in its early history, uh, actually produced electricity. Uh, they, had a, uh, they were generating electricity with water turbines, uh, and that electricity was used primarily for just lighting the mill site. Uh, all of the equipment, all the machinery, was driven by uh, steam uh, power. Uh, st steam turbines uh, to run the equipment. Uh, at one time, this power generation in the mid-1890s also produced electricity for Missoula itself to some extent, for lighting primarily, I'm sure. When the Milltown Dam was built in 1908, 07, 08, the reservoir that it built, that dammed up behind it, rose the water level so high in the lower Blackfoot here that a, the water level came up to within feet of the top of the dam. It, the, the dam could not have a drop of water to run turbines. Uh, and so this dam, the Bonner Dam, no longer was uh, able to produce the electricity that was necessary the Milltown Dam was built, 
Then it provided electricity both to the mill and to Missoula. Another old picture, uh, thanks, I think Bill Taylor gave me this one. This is uh, 1949, uh, and it shows the, uh, the mill site, Bonner itself. By then, of course, we had a railroad going up the Blackfoot. Uh, the cribs, you can still see the cribs were in place. Uh, but when the railroad came in place, they didn't float logs down the river anymore. The last river drive of logs occurred in either 1926 or 1927. Uh, after that, uh, they would bring logs down uh, on by rail. And this spur right here, as you can see that flat landing across the river, it's called the high landing. They'd bring the rail cars in and then offload, just dump the logs into the river. Uh, so they were still using the river for storage of those logs, but they weren't using them to transport logs down the river. Um, there's also a landing that's across from the way station uh, where they did the same thing. They pulled the loaded rail cars uh, of logs and then dumped the logs into the river. So, here you can see the log pond and the logs that were in the river, they would be brought in to the log pond. They had a hydraulic debarker uh, that would debark the logs and then move the logs up into the sawmill to be processed. So, so much about history. Uh, more recent history, 1996 there was a massive ice flow on the river. Uh, you probably, a lot of you remember that ice jam coming down. Uh, and it came down and actually damaged some of the, the Bonner Dam. And that Bonner Dam location is about 200 yards below us right here. Um, it also pushed enough water underneath the dam that it took out some of the understructure of the dam and that's what caused uh, the big sag in the dam structure right there. So when the decision was made to remove the Milton Dam so they could clean up all the toxic sediment that was behind that dam and affecting uh, domestic water and water wells, uh, they had a lot of planning to do. And so in the early 2000s, probably 2002, 2003, uh, they knew they had to remove the Bonner Dam as part of the project of cleaning up and taking out the Milltown Dam. So in 2005, and I'm not sure exactly which one of the many organizations brought this project together uh, but the water level behind the Milltown Dam was still high enough that they could bring barges in and put excavators on top of those barges and then start dismantling the Bonner Dam. So here you see you had a crane on the mill side and it was starting to remove some of the uh, upper structure of the dam. Uh, all that material had to be pulled off the dam, pulled out of the river, and, and hauled off. Here you can see the crane, the barge on the other side, dismantling uh, portions of the dam. And it just, I mean, they just took it apart piece by piece. And, and the dam was built out of logs, sawn timber, and then there were rock-filled cribs that uh, uh, it was basically the, the structure that held it all in place. All that had to come out of the river. It just, it was, it was quite an undertaking. I had nothing to do with this. I just was interested, so I got down and took pictures. After the water levels went down on the Milltown Dam, the Bonner Dam, you could start seeing what was uh, constructed. Uh, there's a dike road 
right on the top of this dike right here. And what they did, you saw those cribs that were in the river in that 1907 photo. And I think the mill side row of cribs was actually then used to construct this dike that protected the log pond uh, from the river. And so behind this dike right here is the log pond. So what I did with this program, I took pictures over from, from 2005 until 2013. Originally, I thought, well, we could build a, a sequence, a date sequence of what happened on the river. And, you know, 15 years later, I realized that I couldn't figure out a good sequence to put these photos in. So what I did is I, I put together a bunch of projects that happened on the river. And this first set right here is basically just showing when the water went down, what we had on the river that at some point in time we had to deal with as far as removing and cleaning up. This is one of the rock cribs. Uh, and these were, these cribs were anchored way into the base of the river. Uh, they were all spiked together with iron spikes filled with rock. They probably came from the quarry right up here across from the way station. Um, and I'm not sure how many of these there were. There were probably close to a dozen of these rock cribs. Uh, but that's, that's what they look like after the, the, the water went down. And you can see various, this is part of the structure around the railroad piers. Here's a rock crib, here's a rock crib, there's one there. And you can see all the logs that are piled along the river as the, the water went down. Well, when all those logs were exposed, uh, the state of Montana, Department of Natural Resources that I work for, took interest in those logs. Uh, the state of Montana claims ownership of navigable rivers uh, between the low water marks on rivers and streams in Montana. And the, how you define a navigable river, and this goes way back to logging in the East Coast, was if you could float logs down the river, it was determined it was a navigable river. Obviously, they floated logs down the Blackfoot, and so the state claimed it as a navigable river. And they said, you know, there's logs, cribs. They said all those logs were abandoned by the lumber companies and therefore became property of the state of Montana. I tried to convince our lawyers in Helena that the mills didn't abandon those logs that they were just storing them there for future <laughs> retrieval because I knew that the, the work to get the logs out of the river and the cost behind getting the logs out of the river was going to be very, very expensive and I didn't think the logs were going to have a great deal of value. Um, so anyway, we had to uh, assert our ownership and start looking at how we were going to remove logs and all of the debris out of the river. Luckily, the Montana Natural Resource Damage Program came up with the money to do the work because DNRC, we didn't have it in our budget to do the work, even though we claimed the logs. NRDP, uh, and I was hoping that Doug Martin was going to be here today because he was a very important part. He worked for NRDP, which I didn't know at the time were a department of the Department of Justice and why Natural Resource Damage Program is part of the Department of Justice was, well, they had sued ASARCO, won the lawsuit, and so the Justice Department had the money, and so they were able to pay for not only the work on the Blackfoot but the work on uh, the Clark Fork behind the Milltown Dam. 
the other thing we found out was that not only were there a vast amount of logs above the Milltown Dam and cribs, when they had the Western Mill, which where the town pump sits right now, um, they did the same thing. They had cribs in the river and they dumped logs in the river for the Western Mill. So down below the Bonner Dam and the Black Bridge somewhere in there uh, was also filled with logs and debris uh, from the activities that took place over 120 years. But you can get an idea of just the vast number of logs that were in the river. And they were pine logs, larch logs, fir logs, uh, nothing, nothing spectacular like you would find in hardwood logs that they were pulling out of rivers and lakes back east. Uh, they were just logs. Um, so, but here's part of the uh, structure where the dam was. This is where the dam came across right here. But every year we'd clean it up, high water would come along, move sediment, bring logs down from the river, and deposit more logs in the river. So you can just, you can imagine the undertaking that, that was there to clean up the river and, and you know, improve the fisheries of the river, improve the recreational uh, opportunities on the river, uh, and, and that was important to all the organizations that were involved in, in the cleanup work in this whole project. Just more pictures of massive, massive amounts of logs. You look down there and you could see those cribs and you could see how deep they, they were going into the river. Here's one of the chains that you can still see that was used to keep the logs from floating down the river, chains like this right here. It was, it was interesting to see, you know, get in the summertime, the Blackfoot River is pretty clear water and you can just see the masses of logs that are laying all waterlogged, um, mixed in with various debris from the mill operations. On the upriver side of these cribs, they had planks that were spiked in there, so when the logs came down the river, they wouldn't dig into these cribs, they would slide up on those planks uh, to keep the, the cribs in place. But you can see the, the spikes that are all through here, and that was on every one of these cribs and so much of the stuff out here, there was you can imagine trying to float down the river and coming across a log that was all full of spikes in your rubber raft. Uh, it wouldn't take long, you'd be at the bottom of the river. Here shows the, the four railroad bridge piers that would eventually have to come out. And this is looking from the swimming rock right up here uh, around the corner, looking down the river. Um, this is 2006. So this was, you know, basically our first look at um, the amount of logs, debris, the structures that were in the river that had been hidden by water for uh, hundreds of years, 100 years or better. Uh, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting to look at it, and it was uh, kind of uh, uh, daunting to think about what it was going to take to clean up the Blackfoot River. And 
And one of the things that uh, people at the Hellgate Forge did uh, was they tried to collect as much of this old iron, uh, not only these spikes, but also in the cribs, they had long iron rods that went down between the logs. And the people at the uh, uh, Hellgate Forge here on the mill site really liked that, uh, uh, that iron to do whatever crafting they were going to be doing in the future. So they collected an awful lot of that. So the NRC had to get involved because we claimed the ownership of the logs. And uh, this gentleman right here is John Hayes, who worked for me at uh, the NRC. Uh, one of our people in the audience here, Scott Keene, uh, was there. And this was a tour uh, for prospective contractors to look at the river, look at the logs around the river, uh, and hear from, from John what we expected a contractor to do uh, to get the logs out of the river. So initially we were thinking, well, we gotta be kind of careful. We don't wanna get down the river and mess the river up and stir up a lot of mud and do all kinds of things. So we had a, this is what we call an escaliner. It's just an excavator that's been set up to have a cable system on it that we would take uh, chokers down on the river and hook logs and drag them up and I mean I watched them pull up some logs and they struggled to pull up some of these logs and they're big logs they're totally water soaked and they were heavy they were very heavy it quickly became evident that with an escaliner we were not going to be able to do the work to get logs out of the river in a timely frame. And so we actually started going down there with uh, grapple skitters. You see the grapple skitter we got hooked up with a cable to something on the other side of the river. So if, if it slid back down the river and couldn't get out through that gravel, it could pull themselves out. But we got equipment down the river and started gathering logs, decking them, and then we had to build a road up uh, from the riverbank up on the high landing so we could get trucks in there to load the logs, and we hauled them over to uh, the West Mill Yard, which is where that big green building is across from Town Pump, and that's where we decked the logs. Did you sign the letter to let them do that? What was that? Uh, I can't remember, Craig. I wanted to know if we signed the, the permits to, to allow them to get in the river. And uh, what we did was, was kind of minor at, the, at, the, at that time. You'll see pictures later on that are a lot more serious than just having a skitter sitting on the bank. But here you can see, as we started pulling stuff up, here we pulled the log up that had a big chunk of this, this chain on it. And there's still chain hanging uh, off some of the rock cliffs on the other side of the river uh, that was part of the anchoring system to hold the logs from going down the river. You see our road that we built up, uh, that we would take the skitters and drag logs up, up there onto the landing so we'd load them on, lo on log trucks. This is down below the Bonner Dam. Uh, you can see the mill up in here. The Bonner Dam was right across here. But below the dam, it was the same thing. It was just chock full of logs and debris. And uh, so we included that in our area of operation and uh, started pulling logs out. And these logs, even after they've been in the, in the river for sometimes close to 100 years, um, the outside of the logs, the ends of the logs, eh, they were kind of punky and, and uh, not in good shape. But 
internally it was still good wood. The tables here, the wood trim, um, all of this material, all these tables, the bar up there, all was made out of logs that were later pulled out of the river by the Hellgate uh, Forge, uh, made into lumber, and, and they, they built these tables and everything for, for the kettle house here. So, I mean, it was good sound lumber even after a year. It was just the cost of cleaning the logs up so you could actually make boards out of them made it very, very expensive to, to deal with those logs. It's, every time I look at these pictures and look at the logs scattered up and down the river here, uh, it's just an amazing amount of, of logs came down the river in 100 years. And this was part of the deck we had over on the, uh, the west log yard. And uh, this is John Hayes and Sarah Pierce, who both were employees. And John, as I said, was in charge of contracting the work to get the logs pulled out of the river. Sarah was in our forest management bureau, and she uh, was responsible for trying to sell the logs. Yes? So the state owned all this wood, is that correct? The state. And so the state sold the wood? We, we tried to sell the wood. Um, it was very expensive to put the logs in these decks, a lot of expense. There wasn't a lot of value in those logs. We tried, to, we tried to sell logs. We thought, well, maybe somebody will buy them. And they were not beating down our door to buy logs. Um, but there were logs that were used. Uh, if you've been to the Native American Center on the University of Montana campus, all of the big pillars in the building are actually from logs that came out of the river. Uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, had uh, remodeled our office space down on Spurgeon Road, and all of the wood trim, uh, the pillars outside and the walkway are all logs that came out of the river. Um, there were several loads of logs that were taken over to the Milltown Reservoir and used for bank stabilization and large woody debris uh, to reform the floodplain uh, on the, the rechanneled Clark Fork River. I believe that the uh, structures at Silvergate Park, the pavilions and, and some of the benches, I'm pretty sure that that wood, those logs came from the stuff out of the river. We at DNRC were thinking, boy, if we can get rid of these, that's what we need to do. And we sold a lot of them really cheap. We gave a lot of them away just because we had decks on somebody else's property that, that we needed to dispose of those logs. So, yeah, it was, um, it was not a money-making proposition. I wish Doug Martin was here because he might remember how much it cost uh, the Natural Resource Damage Program for DNRC to do the work pulling logs out of the river. Um, we made the agreement with NRDP that any money we made on the logs, because they were paying for the work to get them out, any money that we got from those logs, we would give back to NRDP um, because that was only fair. And so um, it was an uh, interesting project. So Scott, get, get, a, get a microphone, Scott. Okay. 
So I was with Stimson at the time when you guys were doing this, and we tried sawing some, but the problem was they were so full of grit and sand. Even when you debark them, you cut the ends off, try to get most of the grit out, um, you'd last a couple logs and the bandsaw would be we dull. We tried some, uh, some of the local guys with some of the wood misers, same thing, log or two, it just ruined a blade. We actually tried chipping them, trying to uh, chip them for pulp, same thing. So they were good logs, but they were just so full of grit that they just, yeah. they broke. Yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. It was, uh, I mean, you would cut off, cut off that end of that log right there that uh, will show later on one of the pictures. But you'd cut that off the end of a log and have to resharpen your chain on your saw because there was so much grit in the, in the outside of those logs. The inside was just fine, but the outsides were miserable. So uh, that's why no one really wanted to pay a lot of money for those logs. So anyway, that's where we're gonna take our first break. So uh, yes, question. Did you count the number of logs? Did you count the number of logs you took out? No, we didn't count the number of logs, um, but I'm thinking based on estimating volume of logs that were in the decks across the river, it was in excess of a million board feet of logs, which is a lot of logs. And um, so uh, numbers, I don't know. And unfortunately, you walk over the bank of the river and look out there today and there's still logs in the river. Uh, every year, high waters would come along, it would wash more of that sediment, move gravel bars back and forth, and there were more logs. And I don't think that's gonna stop uh, because I think every deep hole on the Blackfoot River has probably got logs at the bottom of that hole. Salmon Lake, Placid Lake, Sealy Lake, were all part of the log uh, movement system to get logs down to the mill. All those lakes, Clearwater River, all have logs in them. And so I think there's gonna be logs coming down for a long time. And because of high water, there's logs all the way down to Thompson Falls, all the way into irrigation ditches down the down the Clark Fork River, um, they're, they're going to be around for a long time. So. Why was that a program that the state parks put on and they said they took out 16,000, 16,000 logs and they think there's that many remaining? Uh, I, I wouldn't doubt it, Bob. I mean, Robert, it just... Uh, you saw the pictures, there were so many logs in the river. You think of, they started floating logs down the river probably in 1886. Uh, they floated down logs in the river or stored them in the river until sometime probably in the late 1950s to early 1960s. and that amount of time, there's a lot of logs that sunk out there. And uh, so it was, it was, uh, uh, yeah, 16,000 doesn't surprise me. Craig. Tony, when Scheimer and I run in a log yard down there, we average about 65 logs per load was what was coming in. So if there's 16,000 logs come out, that'd be 246 loads of logs. Yeah. How many, how many loads uh, in a million feet? 400 and some. Yeah, okay, so, I mean, we're talking about a lot of wood that was stored at the bottom of the river uh, or just lost in the bottom of the river. Uh, I had asked, uh, uh, well, uh, Dennis and others who worked around the log pond and at times, uh, the mill would, would uh, they would shut down the, the log pond and they'd actually send, I think, divers into the log pond and hook onto big logs that had sunk in the log pond 
to retrieve them. I don't know if they ever did that in the river itself. Um, so uh, they tried to res you know, reclaim some of those logs that sunk, but obviously they missed a few. So anyway, so we take a break or we got another question. Hi, Jim Hobbick. Uh, in 1952, I was a student here in, at the university <clears throat> in forestry. One of the things that interested me back in 1952 were river pigs. And I want to know how many people looking at me right now have relatives that were river pigs. They wore boots with long spikes on them. And they actually steered the logs down slope and broke up any piles of logs that were touching each other and not flowing evenly to the dam, Bonner Dam. But that river pig was a name that when it was, it was so disgusting to me that I changed my major from forestry to botany and I, be, <laughs> and I, and I, came, I came back in 1960 with a PhD from Wisconsin and became a professor of plant ecology. <laughs> I was interested I, I in... Took a, I took a class from you. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I better shut my mouth. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay, thank you. I just wondered if they floated logs down the Clark Fork down to Milltown. You know, I don't know. Uh, if they ever floated logs down the Clark Fork. They may have, um, you know, but in the early days they had sawmills scattered up, little sawmills scattered all up and down the Clark Fork River and a lot of the logs that, that fed those little mills just came off the hillsides, you know, fairly close to the mill. Uh, this whole operation in the Blackfoot, uh, they were bringing logs from above Seeley Lake, above Clearwater Junction, up in the Ovando Valley, and you know, at, in the early days, the only way to get them to the mill was to float them in the river, and they needed, you know, a lot of logs. And in the early part of the operation of the mill, uh, they didn't get enough logs. They could operate through the summer. And by the fall, they were running out of logs, and then I think they had to shut down the mill during the winter because they had no logs. Uh, they had to wait till the next spring when they could float logs down the river again to operate the mill. Another question back there, Gary? Gary? Yeah, I, I can scream out. So my oh, dad yeah. was a logger for the ATM for many, many years, and the truckers used to come in and dump into the river right here. Back in the early 50s, he was logging a piece of property on the black It was in the springtime. It was in the springtime, and the, the uh, bull pine were just full of sap, and there were a lot of bull pine. Those truckers said they'd bring them in, dump them in the river, and that was the last they'd see of a lot. <laughs> They're still down there. Yeah, well, <laughs> bull pine, like I say, had a lot of sap in them, and they're young ponderosa pine. And uh, yeah, they were pretty heavy, and they would sink pretty easily. Um, but yeah, they, they dumped logs into the river until the 50s, 60s, uh, they had, until they got equipment that was big enough, they started decking logs on the mill site and then using equipment to move those logs into the log pond. And uh, they had a hydraulic barker uh, that came out of the log pond and then a conveyor that brought the logs up into the, the sawmill. And so that's, that's how the operation went. You know, Probably starting in the 
30s into the late 50s, early 60s. Yes, so, so, uh, so I have a, have a question. Every group needs somebody to ask a stupid question, so, so I'm going to do that. <clears throat> so, so why did some logs sink and not all of them? Did a certain amount of time need to pass before a log sank, or was it because they had so much pitch that they wouldn't float, or... Um, I mean, it, a lot of the log didn't sink, <laughs> so why did some sink and some not? The, the bull pine, as I said, are young ponderosa pine. Uh, they, their growth structure has a lot of sap wood in it uh, with wide rings, so they're, they're heavy. Big old pine uh, have a lot of interior wood. The sap wood is pretty narrow. Uh, compared to the size of the log, and that interior was all basically dried wood, so those logs would float. Uh, it didn't have the same problem with larch logs or uh, dug fir logs. It was it was bull pine that was full of sap, and and uh, and they would sink pretty readily. Scott, uh, he, he asked about the Clark Fork. They actually did float logs down the Nine Mile, down the Clark Fork to Lothrop, where the Western Lumber Mill was, until it washed out and they moved it here. So there was logs down the Clark Fork, but I don't think to here, I think it was to Lothrop at the Western Lumber Mill. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, there's history showing that there were logs that floated down Lolo Creek, and so the state claimed that as a navigable stream. Uh, you know, so there were a lot of places that, yeah, they, they did float logs uh, depending on where the mills were and the technology at the time of how to get those logs to a mill. So, so if we haven't got any more questions right now, we'll have an opportunity. Oh. Just, just one more comment. I'm, I'm a carpenter, and uh, I remember when, the time when these logs became available for use, and I thought to myself, well, that's going to do a number on the saw blades. Because years before, I had a wealthy client, uh, Ben Vinner, who it was almost like a bat or something, and uh, got logs that came out of this great small lake. So now it had been saturated with water, but it had salt impregnated in the log. <coughs> not only did it eat all of the salt lakes, it smelled really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't you go ahead and repeat your, your comment? Okay. Uh, my name's Chris Weatherly. I'm out of Stevensville. Uh, I'm a carpenter, been a carpenter for 45 years, and uh, mostly right now I do historic restoration work. I'm rebuilding the blacksmith shop at St. Mary's Mission right now, just about done. But anyway, uh, I remember years ago when, this, when these logs became available, they were out there to use, and I knew he, right away that it was going to do a number on saw blades because previously I had a wealthy client in the Bitterroot who wanted to use, uh, like I said, it was almost like a fad or something, uh, logs that were sunk in the Great Salt Lake. And not only were they waterlogged, but they were impregnated with salt. And uh, really went through a lot of saw blades and sa sandpaper and, uh, uh, and not only that, it smelled really bad. You had to go outside and get fresh air. Thank you. Okay, should we take a break? Get a get a beer. We'll take go to a the bathroom. Do something. <laughs> we'll take a ten minute break and we'll give you a four minute warning. Welcome back. I have one more announcement and then we're gonna let uh, Tony go back to this really great program. Coming in March is our final roundtable for 2024. It's called a confluence of cultures in the Bonner area. It's Sunday. March 17th at 2 p.m., and get this one, St. Anne Catholic Church. It's not going to be here this time. Uh, that is located down the highway at 9015 Highway 200 East. You, go, you just pass it as you go around the bend. It's right next to the school. And it's going to be a great program. What nationalities were represented in early Bonner? This roundtable features stories of the old days from presenters, recordings, and photos. And, not to be missed, Better Than Butte pasties are back. 
dine in or carry out fresh pasties after the program. So I hope we see you all there. Okay, Tony. Okay. There were some questions that came up and some comments that came up over the break. Uh, just uh, uh, talk about them a little bit. One about the history of the, the trail, the Lewis and Clark Trail, or not Lewis and Clark, the Lewis Trail to the Buffalo. And it's, it's kind of exciting to think about the fact that one of the most monumental events that happened from 1804 to 1806, part of that took place right here across the river with Lewis and his party going up the river. That was a pretty monumental uh, achievement in, in 1804, 1806. So that's, you know, for us, us history buffs and people at the, we call it the old roads and rabbit holes uh, gathering at the History Center, we talk about Lewis and Clark and the things they did. To have it in your backyard is, is really pretty interesting. Uh, another question came up was about bringing the logs down the river from Placid Lake, Salmon Lake, Sealy Lake. Um, what they did is they built what we call splash dams. And they'd have those splash dams at the outlets of lakes or at various places in the Clearwater River uh, that would back up water. The logs would be floating on basically flood water, and then they would blast those dams out. The water would come rushing down, logs would come rushing down the, the uh, rivers, and uh, uh, that's how they made sure they could get the logs all the way down to here at Bonner. Um, it was, uh, someone said, and I've heard and read that the time it took to get the logs from like Sealy Lake down to Bonner was a, a month long process. And the river pigs uh, that, that did that work just followed those logs down the river. There'd be log jams, they'd be using uh, PVs and various types of handheld tools to loosen up log jams, uh, get the logs moving again. They followed them down in, in boats, flat bottom boats. Uh, these guys were tough old, tough old guys and it was dangerous work. Uh, so it was, it was, uh, uh, it would have been fun to see, but uh, not fun to do. <laughs> you know, so anyway. So we piled up the logs, tried to get rid of them, had some success, not a great deal of success. The next project, this project is pretty much carried out by uh, Doug Martin and NRDP, was he had to get rid of all these old cribs. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we wanted to recreate a free-flowing river again that could be used recreationally, um, those things had to go. And so uh, Doug Martin with the Natural Resource Damage Program uh, contracted with contractors to actually get out there and, and do the work. And by this time we realized there was, there was nowhere we could be careful about the river and the water. We figured, well, heck, you know, for 100 years they had, or not 100 years, but maybe 50 years, they moved logs down the river, and those logs did an awful lot of damage to the, the bed and banks of the river. A short-term impact by pulling this stuff out probably didn't matter a whole lot, but it needed to be done, and so we had to get equipment right out in the river to do that work. And here's those four cribs above the railroad grade there that uh, they're pulling out, pulling all these logs out, pulling them up on the bank and then hauling off the debris. And it had to be right out in the middle of the river to do that. Um, 
you can see some of the size of logs that were buried in the base of those cribs. And those cribs were probably built in 1884, 1885, somewhere on there when they were getting ready to move logs down the river. So, you know, they've been in the river for over 100 years. And uh, they were pretty well waterlogged. But I was watching them dig through uh, one crib. And I'll get to it here. But you can see here's some of that chain that's hanging off the, the crib there. Pulling logs out. I mean, it was just a, 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 you had to get in there and dig, and you had to dig deep uh, to get those logs out of the river. This is a, what I call the swimming rock right up around the corner up here. And you can see the, one of the cribs right there that they're pulling out. But it was messy work. I mean, you just, you just couldn't help it. it. It had to be. This crib right here, I was standing up on the swimming rock, and he pulled the log out of the bottom of that crib. And now, OK, that had been in there for probably 120 years. It was so deep in the riverbank, in the riverbed, and when he pulled that log out, he lost it, and it floated down the river. It was still dry after probably 120 years. So it gives you an idea how deeply into the, the, the bed of the river uh, those logs were buried to make sure those cribs could withstand millions of logs coming down the river, bumping up against them before they came into the mill. This is working up around the corner from the swimming rock. You can see remnants of cribs. And there's still, if you go to the uh, fishing access site at the old way station there, in low water, you look across the river, there was one of the crib remnants that you can still see right there. Uh, there's not much of it less, but you can see the structure. It, you can see some uh, bolts and, and spikes sticking out of it, uh, one that uh, Doug Martin missed. But Okay, next project. Remember that early picture, 1907, how wide the river was and all of those cribs going up the river? Well, this is 2006. The dam had been pulled out, the water level dropped, and look at how wide the river is there. Rather than two or three rows of of cribs, there's one. And so the original riverbank was probably back in here someplace. And this is what was left over of the log pond. And by this time, uh, and if you have questions about the log pond, uh, uh, Dick Scheimer and, and uh, Dennis Sane would have a lot of information, but by then, this was just used as a cooling pond. Hot water coming out of the, uh, the boilers uh, that produced steam, um, they would pump that water into the cooling pond until it got to an appropriate temperature, then it was put back in the river. And so, but this is what it looked like, 19, or 26, after the dam was gone. You can see the bridge piers are still up here. It is about this time they realized that there was an awful lot of contamination in that log pond. And because it was part of the mill site itself, uh, it became responsibility of Stimson Lumber uh, to clean that up. Uh, so Stimson is responsible for any clean up, clean up of contamination on the mill site or things that were associated with the mill. So you can see from a, a higher view here that finally drained the, uh, the log pond pretty much. There is the, 
the artificial width of the river right here. This is the dike. It is along here. I showed the, that uh, uh, the wood, the, the work that uh, stabilized this uh, this dike road right here. We're sitting right about here. The amphitheater is probably right here. Um, but they had to start working on pulling back all of this contaminated material out of the river and the log bank and the log pond. So there's some of the work, and they had to haul all of this material off. If it was heavily contaminated, they had to haul it, I think, Idaho or someplace. Some of it went up to the BFI uh, dump site. Uh, if it was the least contaminated stuff, it was put here on site uh, where the old dry kiln sat, and they had a big pile of, of the least contaminated material there. But you can see they're starting to reform a new river bank right along here. What was the contamination? They, they dug a tremendous amount of material out of there. Yes? Can we can we get a mic? Can we get a mic? I was just curious what the contamin what was con contaminating it. Uh, Dick Scheimer, tell us what the contaminants were in the in the soil. The uh, pond was used as a <laughs> the pond was used as a the cooling pond, like Tony said, and the water from the boiler. The processed water from the boiler was dumped in there till it cooled, till it uh, reached a compatible temperature with the river. But in the process of, of using water for the boiler, they added chemicals to it to soften it, remove uh, impurities. Otherwise, they just crust up inside. So they added a lot of chemicals that they used in the boiler to purify the water so it wouldn't cause that problem. And then that water was, uh, excess water was dumped into the pond for cooling. And that process went on till they shut the boilers down. Well, and then you can imagine, you know, you had all this equipment out here, running across here, uh, hydraulic fluid, diesel fluid, uh, getting leaked on when they had the old Shea engines up here going, uh, they had an oil storage, I think it was an oil storage tank buried in the ground, probably right up here someplace, not too far from us. There's always leakage in, in those tanks and, and on that equipment. And so all of that over a long time, a hundred some years, uh, contaminated soils. And so wherever they found a concentration of contaminated soils, then they started a process to remove that and haul it off to an appropriate disposal site. You see they're, they're making progress. Here's the new riverbank that they're building there. You can see they went quite a ways back and digging stuff out. And it was concrete forms, you know, uh, footings and all kinds of stuff that had to come out. And, and I don't know how many pieces of equipment or who knows what was in, in that site, the old log pond site. So, all said and done, here they had the new river bank built. The river was eh, maybe close to the original width of the river, maybe a little less. Uh, they put fiber uh, fabric down on it, grass seeded it, and, and uh, it looked pretty good. It was uh, a good job on that part. You can look across at the other side, and you're still you know, digging out material that was still contaminated. You see all the piles of, of dirt and stuff they dug out that eventually they had to move someplace. The next project uh, that 
DNRC got involved in again, um, the Clark Fork Coalition uh, had a grant to remove these piers out of the Blackfoot River as well as uh, two or three piers from the old Milwaukee Railroad above Tura on the Clark Fork. Uh, we tried to get legal access to the piers on the Clark Fork. We're not able to get legal access from the adjoining landowners. So best I know, those piers are still there. But we had access to these piers and so we got a contractor again and, and uh, told him what we had to have done and he had the equipment and the know-how to, to do it. So I actually have a jackhammer on this excavator and he just pounded those piers into small enough chunks that the excavator then could haul them out of there. And then there was all kinds of wood debris from the cribs around those piers that had to be removed. Again, it was a, it was a, a quite a project. You can see a little more of, of pulling those uh, and destroying those cribs right there. Well, okay, the water went down. Uh, this is probably 2012, 2013, uh, every spring more and more sediment was washed out and uh, uh, the river got cleaner. Lo and behold, the Bonner Dam wasn't gone. Uh, then 2005, they just didn't get down deep enough to pull out the entire dam structure. And so you can see close up, uh, you see logs. There were reports I've read that some of the logs they put in the understructure of the dam in 1884 were 100 feet long. And they, they put them lengthwise this way and then built the dam on top of that and stacked it full of rocks. So. This had to come out if we we're truly going to have a free flowing river again. So, as you can see, we just got out in the river and we did stuff because that's the only way to get it done. And uh, we had this, uh, this hauler here, and the excavator would dig stuff up and load it in the hauler, and he'd haul it up on the bank down here and deposit it. And some of the logs were too big to actually put in this hauler, and so they had to walk those big logs. Up on the bank one at a time. And you see that's a big piece of equipment. Look at the size of that log. Now you tell me how those guys in 1884 got that log and buried it deep in the riverbed. I mean, they did it, but how they did it, I haven't the foggiest idea. <laughs> but they knew what they were doing, and uh, they got it done. Uh, so um, we undid it for them. There's my good friend Dick Scheimer, and this is uh, a manufactured beam that we pulled out uh, of, of the remains of the Bonner Dam. And you can see more of them back in here. Uh, those, are, those are big pieces of, of uh, squared logs that were into the, the dam structure itself. At some point in time, in one of the rebuilds, whether it was it was 1908 or 1949 or uh, somewhere in there, they actually started uh, putting concrete into the dam structure itself. And so we had all these big chunks of concrete that we had to pull out. Had all these squared 10 by 10 uh, timbers that came out. Uh, it was just a lot of material that, that went into the river at one time and had to come back out. 
you can see the size of some of those chunks of concrete. And I'll show another picture of this, some broken mill part that was actually thrown into the concrete when it was, when it was put in the river and kind of used as rebar. Here's the, here's the log that came out, and that's this one right here. And, you know, you can see this end of the log, but as soon as you go to the cut side, that's pretty good wood. Um, but I had been out there with a couple of my, my guys, and, and I saw that log in the deck, and I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Uh, this is cut, this is a, a ponderosa pine log. Uh, it's cut right at the whirl uh, where, the, where the branches uh, start out every year, every growth year. It comes out with five branches and then a terminal branch. And uh, so you can count the years by looking at those whirls going up a ponderosa pine. But this happened to, when they cut the log, it happened to be cut right through that whirl. I said, that'd be kind of fun to have. And a couple of days later, it was on my desk in my office. And so uh, it took about three years for it to dry out. And then I, I dug all the material out of it and, and then gave it to the history center. Down just above the Black Bridge, Here's an old car that was above the Black Bridge. Uh, Peter Nielsen from the County Health Department pointed that out to me. Somebody pulled it out, I'm not sure, because this, during this time, they were pulling out or redoing the Black Bridge, uh, rebuilding the Highway 200 Bridge. There was a lot of stuff going on and, and they probably pulled that out at that time. Here's some more, another picture of the log chain uh, that uh, went down there. Uh, this, this chain is, uh, is hand forged um, and they hand forged a lot of it to go. I don't know how many hundreds of feet of chain we pulled out of the river, how many hundreds of feet may still be in the river, um, but it was, Pretty heavy duty stuff. Here's one of the logs that actually still has the brand on it, US. So that was a log that came off Forest Service National Forest Land. Uh, they branded the logs in the end with uh, who the logger was or who owned the timber, uh, floated them down the river, and some of them sank and they never got paid for them because they were still in the river. But that's how they identified ownership or logger or timber sale that, uh, that a, logs came off from. This is a, a handmade, I don't know, I think it might be a rock pick or something that I was walking along the bank and found that in the river. I'm not sure um, why that was in the river, but it, that's where I found it. Here's an old engine block that was in the river. A hand crank, that's a, that came off a pretty old vehicle. Um, I, I don't know, somebody ran off the road or pushed it off the road or whatever. It broke down and they didn't want to deal with it, so they threw it in the river. Here's some of the spikes and stuff. You can see a log here with spikes in it. You know, we tried to get all that stuff out of the river for recreational purposes so it would be safe for people to be floating down the river again. There's a, an old uh, roll of cable that was in the river that was being used for something and it, they lost it and it rolled down the bank into the river. There's the, the PV, this one right here. This was used to, to roll logs that were in a log jab someplace or they had to uh, break a log jam full. And they were in the river when they were doing this 
And if they lost their balance or something, the PV slipped out of their hands and went to the bottom of the river and they pulled all kinds of PVs out of the river. There are still PVs laying out there, I'm sure, in the bottom of the river. Anybody know who created the PV? It was, it was a guy from Michigan. His name was PV. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like the Pulaski. You know, that was created by a guy by the name of Pulaski. This was one of the old uh, wheel hubs that was pulled out of the river. These came. These were used on the uh, lumber carts around the mill. Uh, they had horses that would pull lumber carts. Uh, around the mill till they got to a, a place where they were piling the lumber up to uh, to dry it. Uh, and uh, so we had several of those in the river. There's one of the old wheels. Just off the, the bank right below the dam, if something broke in the mill, they couldn't fix it. They had to get rid of it. So what'd they do with it? They threw it in the river. It was out of sight, out of mind. And this one bank was just covered with chunks of broken grate and conveyor chain of some kind and, and uh, you know, broken metal parts. Um, and then I think, I think Peter Nielsen got some crew together and actually came up the river and cleaned up a lot of the debris, the metal debris that was on the banks of the river, hauled it off, did something with it. Uh, it was all, I think, volunteer help uh, to get that done. Part of an old railroad track that was down the river someplace. There's part of the old lumber cart. This one was right down below the Black Bridge um, and it disappeared. I don't know if somebody got down there and, and pulled it out or whatever, but it was a, a two-axle lumber cart that they would come off the green chain or, or whatever, put it on the cart, and then haul the cart down to where they were stacking the lumber uh, for, for drying it. There's an old spike that was driven in holding part of a uh, a crib together or some some structure. And all that concrete that was used at one time, it was just all kinds of broken chunks of gears and chains and everything that they just threw in there to help, I guess, hold the concrete together. Or cement. More. And that one picture back a while ago on that big chunk of concrete, there's the remains of that. Um, and some more. And I think that's the end. So we have questions. Test, test. And if, if you have a question, please get one of the mics to so we, everybody can hear. Hi, I'm wondering where did all the refuse go? Where did all the refuse go from the cleanup? <laughs> you know, there's various types of refuge. There was log refuge, wood refuge, there was metal refuge, uh, there was contaminated soil. Uh, some of the most contaminated uh, soil material, I think, went to a depository in Idaho. Um, it was it would take high concentrations of contaminants at, at that site. Some of it was uh, not so bad, and it went to I think the BFI landfill here in Missoula. Uh, some of it, the least contaminated stuff, was kept on site until a, few, a couple of years ago, and they finally removed that. Wood debris. I mean, there's there's various people that took uh, squared timbers, those 10 by 10 timbers, and trying to make something out of them. Some of the logs were used for some purpose. 
um, the metal debris, uh, the Hellgate Forge collected an awful lot of that to use those uh, old iron metal pieces to build things out of. So it went various places. Way in the back. What would have happened if the state hadn't wanted the lumber? <laughs> if the question again was, what would have happened if if the state hadn't wanted the lumber? <sighs> well, it would have come up, you know, because it was it was such an obvious hazard to the fisheries and to recreational use of the river that it, it had to come up. And, and so my, my guess is that uh, the various organizations, Fish, Wildlife, and Park, uh, uh, Department of uh, Environmental Quality, uh, they would have been looking to find some way to get the river cleaned up. Just happened that DNRC and the state decided they wanted to clean the logs and that's how I got involved. So, another question. Hi. Um, were there any uh, interesting, like, pre Lewis and Clark Native American artifacts found during the cleanup? No. The, uh, you know, the best of our knowledge, uh, Lewis, Meriwether Lewis and his party were camped someplace in the Missoula Valley. And when they left the Missoula Valley, they high-footed it up the trail to the Buffalo and camped someplace around, uh, what's that park up there? Huh? Angevine Park, someplace up in there was their first night. So they went through here pretty rapidly. It only took Lewis's party, I think, four days to get from basically the Missoula Valley to over uh, Lewis and Clark Pass uh, on the other side of the Continental Divide. So they didn't waste any time. And, and, and they were not doing anything, it's like maybe watering their horses, maybe fishing in the river itself, and we did not find any artifacts. You know, there may be some out there, but we didn't find any. Microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. Uh, my name is Tom Beers. I, I was wondering whether or not, since all of this work has been done, how that has improved, or do we have any idea yet how it's improved the fishery? You got any, any information on the fisheries? I think just yeah, just the removal of the dam itself would have been an, an improvement because for all those years it was blocking uh, bull trout runs, cutthroat runs. That, those were the only trout in the river at the time. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, in those years we didn't have rainbow and brown trout. It was just uh, bull trout and cutthroat. But they were migratory. And those dams blocked those migrations. And uh, so I, I think probably from a fishery standpoint, the biggest uh, benefit was to get rid of both Milltown Dam and the modern dam. But, uh, you know, ridding the river of the contamination and making it safe for recreation sets, that's, that's also important. And, and I think that in the Milltown Reservoir, I think there was a population of Northern Pike. Right. And I think removing the dams probably also allowed Northern Pike to move up and down the river systems. Well, I think makes... probably uh, getting rid of the reservoir uh, reduced the population of, of northern pike yeah. in the whole system because they're really not river fish. We have them in the Bitterroot, 
in the lower Bitterroot where there are big sloughs and, and places like that where they for them to uh, reproduce and stuff. And there are places along the Clark Fork where they could do that too. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, uh, I'm not sure how that affected the, the northern pike population. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of other problems. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, I'm Dennis Workman. I was the fisheries manager here in the region for about 20 years. Any other questions? We still got 10 minutes. <laughs> so, if there's anything you saw or didn't understand, feel free to ask. If not, Tony, uh, I've got a question. Could you yeah. hold up the gun barrels? And oh, yeah. Explain them. Yeah. This artifact was also pulled out of the river, and it is an old muzzle-loading, double-barreled shotgun that looks to be probably a 20-gauge, maybe, uh, percussion cap, uh, still part of the ramrod that was in it. Uh, it was found right down here by uh, the guys from the uh, Hellgate Forge uh, when they were pulling some logs out. And how long it had been in there, I don't know what somebody was doing, if they were hunting ducks or something, but it's a, you know, to be a muzzle loader, the percussion cap, it's an old, old shotgun. So who knows what you might find out there in the river yet. This, uh, this one here is, uh, I think Dennis said it was a slip pike. Uh, if you look at the end, it spiraled right here on the point. And Dennis said they would shove that into a log and twist it, and then it would, it, it would hold into the wood, and then they could move the logs around the, uh, the log pond, move them over towards the uh, debarker, uh, something like this, but they probably also use these in the river pushing logs into uh, the log pond and that's where I found it. It was in the river. So yeah, there's there's probably still lots of stuff to find. If, you, if you're really into it, low water, get out there and walk across those sandbars and you know, gravel bars and, and see what you might find. So you didn't find the bones of any of those river pigs or? No, no. You know, I've, I've seen pictures of in, uh, in 1948, uh, that high water, that uh, flood that came uh, right at the top of the dam. There was a lot of debris uh, that, was, that was hung up in the dam structure itself. And uh, one of the guys out there on top of that dam was, I think, Arnie Karkinen. And he's out there in the middle of the river, and he's got one of these pikes, and he's poking away at stuff. Uh, I can't imagine how dangerous that was and how many people might have fallen in the log pond uh, over the years. Uh, and when I worked for Anaconda for that uh, one first winter, you get down the log pond and the, the uh, walkways around the log pond were just all covered with ice. And uh, I'm sure people fell in, right, Dennis? A few times. Yeah, <laughs> a few times. So, yeah. You fell in the upper pond in the wintertime, you really didn't want to get out too quick because that was a heated pond. <laughs> <laughs> It was a long, hard walk down the donkey shock to change clothes. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed the, the slideshow and, and a little bit of history of cleaning up the Blackfoot. Well, that concludes our program for February. We'll uh, thank you so much, Tony.
And we will see you on March 17th at St. Anne Church to learn about the old days of different settlers in Bonner. So thanks for coming. <laughs>